Welcome to Lecture 3 of, of Advanced Dynamics, MEC 4428. Today we're going to talk about dynamics of a particle. Last time we talked about kinematics, and uh, the time before was just an introduction. But this time we're going to talk about uh, being able to find the equation of motion for a single particle under defined applied forces. So we're going to start out pretty simple. And then we're going to talk about understanding the concept of work, potential energy, kinetic energy, momentum, and impulses. And it's more than just understanding, perhaps. We're actually going to use this for something uh, useful. Uh, because if you look at how to do objective one, we have to use Newton's laws. And number two helps you, in a sense, cheat and get around the issues of using Newton's second laws. As a problem objective, something you might be able to solve. Uh, last time we spoke of kinematics, uh, particles, position, velocity, and acceleration. For example, uh, this person may be holding a glass of milk or something, and then we'd be able to describe uh, what the, how that, say, that glass of milk is moving around as this thing is rotating and this, this length is changing or something along those lines. We talked about how it moved, but this time we're going to see why it moves and uh, be able to describe it with regard to the forces applied upon it. All right, so what we're looking for are particles, position, velocity, and acceleration based on applied forces, really. And, for example, can you tell me how fast they're turning if they each have a mass of about 55 kilograms? So if we say we just have these people on these, these ropes, by just knowing the angle from these ropes to the, to the central bar here, presuming that this is a rope, then we can figure out how fast they're going around in a circle. Now about equations of motion, Newton's second law of motion, all right, and this is something you sh should know pretty well by heart, it relates the momentum of an object to the forces applied to it. So if we have, say, some of the forces on an object, and we'll call that with a, 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 a vector f sub i, where the i are all the different, in, indicate each of the different forces on the particular particle, that's equal to the, it, the rate change of momentum with respect to time of that particle. So if you look at some of the forces on a particle, that's equal to the change with respect to time of the momentum of that particle. Right? And, and uh, again, this sum of the forces uh, is equal to the, the summation sign over i of the vector f sub i on a particular object, so one of the objects. Later on, we'll talk about several objects, and we'll have to change this a bit. In any case, m is the mass of the object, assume constant, all right, for the moment, when we write this, and you're used to probably seeing this version of the equation of motion, uh, the sum of the forces is equal to the mass times acceleration. But strictly speaking, that's not true, because what if the mass is changing with respect to time, like for a rocket? This is really Newton's second law, and don't forget this. But this works no matter what the situation is, near the speed of light or anything. It doesn't really make any difference. All right, so. If we say A is absolute acceleration of the particle with respect to an inertial frame. And so remember last time I made a lot of noise about how we have to find the absolute acceleration and acceleration with respect to an inertial frame. Then this is where it's important. This acceleration that you're finding, R double dot, notice it's lowercase r double dot, because that's because it's with respect to a fixed frame. P is its momentum. and P, the momentum, is equal to the mass times the velocity of the particle, where velocity is, again, the inertial or absolute velocity. Right. So you have to define everything in terms of absolute coordinate system, or a, and fixed coordinate system. Strictly speaking, as I said before, strictly speaking, the sum of the forces on a particular particle is always equal to the rate change in time of the momentum doesn't matter if it's relativistic motion, so like, uh, you know, if you're moving near the speed of light and uh, you turn on your headlights and, you know, what happens, those sort of things, then the Newton's second law still works. Uh, as well, if it's a rocket, you know, when you think about a rocket, it's throwing most of its mass out the, the rear nozzle and its mass changes over time, but this is still true. So for classical mechanics, for example, the th kind of things we're pretty much talk about in here we say that the momentum is just the time rate of change of the quantity mass times the position, and where this this r is a position vector, and again this r is with respect to a fixed coordinate system. For relativistic mechanics, however, this isn't true, and where you actually have to take into account the fact that you have speed of light in a vacuum, and everything is compared relative to that velocity. So, for example, the momentum, and we write a little tilde above the momentum here to show the wavy bar thing to show that it's slightly different definition. 
it's the mass times the velocity, and this is the scalar velocity, right? So like the speed, divided by one minus the velocity squared, divided by the speed of sound squared, uh, all of that with the square root sign. And this is along that same direction as velocity. All right, and then quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics is, uh, is a peculiar thing as well, but don't overestimate it. It's not as bad as it might seem. The key is, is that if you have what's called uh, psi here, a wave function, that describes the state of the particle. And when you say the state of the particle, what you're meaning is its wave state and so forth. They're all sort of interchangeable terms in it because it's a, they really uh, exhibit the behaviors of a single um, phenomenon. And what you see here is you have, all right, they have h, h bar over i, where i is the measuring number here, right? Delta psi, delta psi. So you can define this Newton's second law, and it's valid no matter what the situation. It's just that your momentum definition changes. Most of the time we'll use this, but it is sometimes nice to know about these other things, especially if you talk to people over in the physics department or something, or maybe you get involved in that type of area. Important thing is that the definition of the momentum changes to fit the need. The equation itself, Newton's second law itself, does not. Newton, the equations of motion for a single particle, Newton's second law, may be written as one vector equation or a set of three or fewer algebraic equations. It just depends on the the f degrees of freedom of the particle, how many ways that the particular particle can move. So if you just have one particle, you have one vector equation or three or fewer algebraic equations. That's all you need, no more, no less. There are a few ways to find the equations of motion, but uh, here we go. There are two parts to finding the equations of motion for a particle. First, find the absolute momentum of the particle. Then, find the forces placed on the particle. And if you have to draw a free body diagram, it's not, it's not a bad idea to draw a picture with the forces applied to it. The momentum is m times acceleration, r double dot, if the mass m is constant. Otherwise, the rate change in mass has to be considered. And so we may have the situation where P is equal to the time derivative of MR, right? So that, I should say MR dot, so that's actually equal to MR double dot plus M dot R dot. And actually this should have a dot above it, I'm sorry. That should be P dot is equal to MR double dot plus M dot R dot. Again, this should be P dot, all right? And so this is no really not different anything different than before. There's a time dependence in a function, and you take a time derivative of it. Don't ignore the dependence. If you have a mass change rate of time, you can't ignore it. You have to leave it in there. All right. But the idea is, is that you find the absolute momentum of the particle first, and then you find the forces placed on the particle after that. The way you find the absolute momentum of the particle, of course, is to find the position of the particle, absolute position of the particle, then find the absolute velocity of the particle find the absolute acceleration of the particle if you have to. One of the problems that you find about this sort of material is, is that solving the equations of motion is a lot harder to do than just finding them. Invariably, finding equations of motion, well, a lot of times it's maybe a few pages, sometimes 10, 20 pages of algebra and exciting math. But the problem is, is that when you go to solve the equations of motion, Sometimes, no matter how smart you are, there is no solution. In general, there are no solutions for a particle subject to Newton's second law. In other words, uh, some of the forces is equal to m r double, uh, r double dot, and this is where we're assuming constant mass even. Uh, but for many cases, we can find an equation to this. Uh, we can find a solution to the equations of motion. For at least one can learn enough about the behavior to know something useful. For example, you can use uh, those first integrals that we talked about from the very first lecture. Let's look at an example or two. Constant acceleration or a constant applied force ion rocket, say. So suppose we have this rocket down here that's badly drawn, and we'll have a, the ion rocket has a mass m that, for argument's sake, remains constant. And this is true for ion rockets. If you don't know what ion rockets are, then give a, give a look at Wikipedia. There's actually quite a bit of interesting information about them. The force imparted by the engine is, is f in a straight line and is constant here. All right, so let's find the motion of the rocket. If we use Newton's second law and a free body diagram, notice that we have a free body diagram drawn here where we have written x with respect to a fixed coordinate, okay? And this is a unidirectional system, so we're left with one algebraic equation as a consequence of the Newton's second law, 
originally it's a vector equation. It's always a good idea to start out with the vector equation and then see what you've got in terms of each of the components of the motion of the, of the, of the particle afterward. So we've got an applied force from the left due to the, the exiting of the, of the ion, ion wind to the left and we have mass m here at the mass center and then we just say that the direction of motion is e sub 1. So some of the forces, well it's f. And scalar f e sub 1, it's in the e sub 1 direction. Mass times acceleration, well that's just m x double dot along the e sub 1 direction as well. That just turns out to be a scalar equation because we can cancel out the e sub 1 directions. Everything's in the same direction, right? So is f equals ma is equal to mx double dot uh, x double dot, the acceleration is equal to the applied force divided by the mass of the rocket and then we can integrate a couple of times so then the velocity of the rocket is equal to the quantity f over m times time t plus a constant, we don't know what that is without the initial conditions and then we get the position vector, it's equal to f over 2m times t squared, time squared that is plus c1 times time t plus c2 and these c1 and c2 constants are found using initial, final, or intermediate conditions at some time so always keep in mind that you can maybe know where it started at, where it's ending at, maybe it runs into something and you know what the conditions are. And you can run these equations in reverse to figure out where it started out. Or you can say that you know you've had a look at it when it was flying in space at one moment and you can see where it came from, it means with time prior to the observation time, and then after that time. So don't always be closed-minded in thinking, well, you know, t is equal to zero, and then what happens afterwards, you can run things backwards as well. Say the rocket starts out at rest, then. x at time is equal to t zero. So, for example, I'll write x as a function of time t. We just substitute in zero for t here. Well, that's equal to zero. Say and that's equal to c2, so then c2 is equal to zero. The velocity at time zero is equal to zero as well, and that's uh, plus c1 here. Sorry, x dot zero is zero, and that's equal to c1. So c1 and c2 are equal to zero. So then, as a consequence, the position of the rocket is just equal to the the, the force f divided by two times the mass times the time squared. And so the position is a quadratic function of time t. The a, v, and x here are all absolute quantities. It's important to have that because we're talking about using Newton's second law. Now let's take a look at the same example, but let's change something. Let's change it so that the mass of the rocket is a function of time. All right, so suppose it's a chemical rocket, say, a uh, typical rocket like the space shuttle or whatever. Most rockets have this kind of behavior where mass is a function of time. Newton's second law, again, is the force, applied force, is equal to the sum of the applied forces here. And we're going to write capital F. So this stands for the summation sign over I of lowercase f sub i equal to the rate change of time of the momentum. This, this turns out to be an m dot times the velocity v plus m v dot. So it's a rate, chain, rate, uh, rate change of mass with respect to time times the velocity of the rocket plus the mass of the rocket times the rate change of time with, of the velocity. For the rocket then, since this is unidirectional again, then we're going to use a scalar equation and we're just dividing out by e sub 1. So we've changed this from a vector equation to a scalar equation because everything's moving in one direction. Without knowing how m and f change with respect to time, there's just really not much more we can do. And this is one of these sort of problems where, you know, without being able to say um, what f is, especially, not much more we can do. Now let's take a look at what happens if say the applied force is a function of time. Suppose that we go back and we say that, all right, we're going to make the mass of the rocket constant again. All right? So we're going to go back to our ion rocket. So a function, the, f the force is equal to the mass times acceleration, m times r double dot. And so we're throwing out the chemical rocket. We're going to the ion rocket now. So the, we define f is equal to f as a function of time as it is applied to this, to this rocket. So this is going to vary over time, by and, st and the acceleration then is going to be defined by Newton's second law because r double dot is equal to the, f the force divided by the mass. And if we integrate once, well, we get an integral here, and we're using tau as a dummy variable, means that it integrates out because we're going to from time when it started to the time that we're observing it, time t, and we need to integrate here. So we just to keep the 
the notation from using T three times and you don't know which T you're talking about, we substitute in a tau here for this T. Because this tau and this integration goes from the initial time, zero, out to our final time, T. We also end up with a, a constant. Notice that this is still a vector. This is a vector. It's a vector constant. It's a vector constant. Remember, this is a vector equation. When you integrate a vector equation like this with respect to time, you end up with an integer constant. It's not a scalar constant. The, w always remember that if you have a, a vector here, you always have to have vectors all on in every term on the right-hand side. Okay, so if we integrate it again, we should get a similar sort of deal. If I integrate from zero to time t, well, it's the same integral we had before, and that's over tau. I'm going to say that's tau 1 this time, all right? And then we'll integrate it again from 0 to tau 1. And that's dummy variable tau 2. It's a little confusing, but it's just so that we keep everything straight. So you do the inner, inner integral first, and then you do the outer integral after that, right? So you also have to integrate with respect to time our constant. So that goes from 0 to time t of c1 d tau, dummy variable again. And then we have another constant here, c2. Notice it's also a, a vector constant. So c1 is a constant here. So an integral of from 0 to t of c1 d tau is c1 t. Okay, simple enough, because we can just pull c1 out of this integral, and the integral of, of 0 to t d tau is just t itself. So our position vector that is defined as this integral, right, plus c1 t plus c2. And if we can, we know what our initial conditions are, then we can find what c1 and c2 would be, all right? Suppose that, that um, v at time equals 0 is equal to v0, and the position is r0 at time is equal to 0. Then c1 is equal to v0, and c2 is equal to r0. Notice these whole equations are all vector equations. So if we said we, we wanted to do the calculations of, say, the propagation of a rocket in 3D, this is the equation that would tell you what the, the trajectory would be. And you can include in this force, f, drag, the force due to the rocket, uh, somebody throwing you know spare parts out the window, whatever, it doesn't make any difference. You, you can throw everything in this force and you'll get the position. So you've done the 3D equation and basically found yourself a solution without knowing it. For those of you that might have a little bit of vibrations background, this is related to the Duhamel's integral. Okay. Let's take a look at an example. We'll take this ion rocket again in particular, and where the forces are all along, along in the same direction. And we're going to say that the thrust here, the force, the thrust coming out of the engine, or the force on the rocket, is a function of time. All right, so we're going to say that this function of time, we're actually writing it out explicitly. It's going to be some constant force divided by 2, for reasons we'll show you a little bit later. But at any rate, it's a constant force times 1 plus sine beta t. And this beta is this period of chugging, and I'll show you what I mean by that later on. But if you notice what goes on, you can see that this force will actually go, the force as a function of time t, I should say, goes from, from f naught at its peak down to zero. So, and it's a function of beta. So, this is like describes our period, it's, it's our wave number, one over our period roughly, and this uh, f naught is the magnitude of the force. And what we're looking for here is motion of the rocket if x at time equals 0 is 0, and v is at time equals 0, 0. So it's starting out at rest. And we have the force. It's equal to the mass times acceleration. Okay, and it's an ion rocket, so we're ignoring the fact that the mass might change. And if we integrate a couple of times, we get first the velocity is equal to f naught over 2m and times integral of 1 plus sine beta tau. Notice we're using dummy, integral, dummy variable here, d tau, plus x naught. All right, and that's this is our constant. That's our constant, it's like our C1. We know that's going to be equal to zero because it's starting out to rest, at rest. And if we do this integration, we get F naught divided by 2m is equal to t minus 1 divided by beta, cosine beta t, plus 1 over beta. This 1 over beta term, okay, it appears as a consequence of that zero. It starts out at zero, doesn't it? Time equals zero. All right. So if we look at our position, then we do the integration again, and yeah, it's a little painful, but the position starts out at rest, right? So our C2, or our x at time equals 0, is equal to 0. So 
So then the, the position of a rocket over time is given by F0 divided by 4m times t squared minus 2 sine beta t divided by beta squared plus 2t divided by beta. That's the position of the rocket. So say the period of chugging is 2 and the mass of our rocket is 10 kilograms, pretty light rocket really, and the force is equal to 10 newtons. And using Mathematica we can get the results shown on the next page here. It's a bit small, let me see if I can increase the size. There we go. So here's the applied force. The force is a function of time. See it goes up to 10 and down to 0 as I said. This is F0 is equal to 10, right? And it goes up and down. It goes through one cycle in about, uh, about, um, about pi a second, something like that. Okay? So if we look at the velocity of the rocket, it goes up with time, but it has this strange pulse style behavior, doesn't it? So we see that the, the speed of the rocket is accelerating and decelerates, accelerates and decelerates, accelerates and decelerates. That's because the force applied due to the engine actually varies over time. And if you look at the distance, you can actually see the distance that is traveled is a bit flat and increases, and it's a bit flat, increases, a bit flat, increases, and it th becomes less important over time because the, the overall velocity is getting to be so high. But especially at first, it's significant. This type of phenomenon is called chugging, and it was a common thing in an early part of the space program. What what one would see was they would see as the rocket is taking off from a launch pad that as it is started up, the the fuel and liquid oxygen from the tanks in a liquid ro liquid rocket liquid rocket uh, would go down into the pump and flood the the turbo pumps that were supplying the the fuel and the, and the liquid oxygen say to the engine and it would cause them to stall. And when those, those turbo pumps stalled, they stopped delivering quite so much of the, the fuel and oxygen, and reducing the force that the engines were generating. So it caused the rocket to decelerate, it caused the force to drop, and caused the rocket to uh, stop the velocity to drop. That lowered the, the acceleration of the rocket, and as a consequence then, the, the turbo pumps were, were the, the force of the, of the fuel and the and the, the liquid oxygen, say, on the turbo pumps uh, was dropped, the turbo pumps ran better, and then the, the force went back up again, and, and the cycle repeated over and over again. If you look back on some of the very earliest launches back in the late 50s and 60s from the United States, you see, see this phenomenon, and it's been known to cause at least four or five uh, accidents due to this chugging phenomenon. You actually can look this up on the Internet as well if you like. Now then, if we look at applied forces as a function of position, then the things change a little bit. We've already looked at, say, having a, a constant applied force, a situation where we don't know what the applied force is, and we found out there's really not much we could do with that. We only had one slot there about that. And then we tried changing the force as a function of time. Now let's see what happens when we have the applied force as a function of position. So let's say that the force is equal to a function of x. Then this function this f of x, so some of the forces on the body is a function of x, that's equal to m x double dot. And again, we're going to say, that for argument's sake, that the mass isn't changing. But look, there's actually going to be a trick here that we're going to use, and this is an important trick to remember. That's the reason why this next part is in red. x dot is equal to the velocity v, right? So then if we take the second derivative, the acceleration, uh, the second derivative of the position vector x, say, that's equal to the velocity vector v dot, and then dv dt, right? But dv dt, so the chain rule is dv dx, dx dt. Notice that it works, the chain rule works the same way with vectors as it does with scalars. dv dx, dx dt, chain rule, and this is dv dx times velocity v. So this force is a function of x, well that's equal to mx double dot, let's replace it. So it's m dv dx times v. Well, if we rearrange things, we can say that m dv times v, or m v dv, that's equal to f of x dx. Notice that we have, oops, oops, sorry. 
Notice that we have mv dv and fx dx. We can integrate both sides, left-hand side from v naught to v. And I should have used a dummy variable here. I'm sorry. This should be something other than v. mv dv, for example, from v naught to v. And then the right-hand side, f chi d chi. And chi here is a vector still. And that goes from x naught to x. This v naught and x naught are like the initial velocity and and position that we're looking at, and then v and x are the final position, or velocity and position, respectively. If we integrate both sides, we end up with one half of m times v dot v. Right? If we have v times v for scalars, it's v uh, dot product v for vectors minus v naught dot v naught, and that's equal to an integral of x naught to x of f chi d chi, and this force. Well, we said it was a function of the position, but we didn't say what function it is. So there's not much more we can do about the right-hand side here. But if we say that v dot v is equal to v squared, so the velocity vector, vector dot producted with itself, that gets rid of the direction and just tells us what the magnitude is going to be. So v dot v is equal to v squared, where v here is a scalar. And then v naught dot v naught is a similar sort of deal. It's v naught squared, where v naught is a scalar here. And that's one half m v squared minus v naught squared. Any ideas what this might be? And I hope you know it says kinetic energy. So once we found v as a function of time, position of x as a function of time is just integration away. So once we found this, if we know of f, then we can find what our our uh, the position might be as well. So let, now let's look and see what happens. Suppose that the thrust in the ion rocket is f as a function of x, right? Not a function of time anymore, but x is equal to f1 cosine x plus f0, where f1 and f0 are constant. The way this might happen is, is that say that it's going through an atmosphere, or it's um, it's being affected by a magnetic field based on position. These sort of things do happen. I mean, when you're talking about launching a chemical rocket into into low Earth orbit. It is a function of the distance from the surface of the Earth because of the because of the effects of of uh, air pressure on say a rocket, n not notwithstanding the fact that you also have drag to worry about. But a chemical rocket problem is a lot more difficult to solve, and so we're going to ignore the fact that the mass might be changing. That's why we're talking about ion rockets. So we have a an m here, and the force is equal to the mass times acceleration x double dot. It's equal to f1 cosine x plus half naught, okay, from our definition. So then mx double dot is equal to mv dv dx, right, using our chain rule trick, where this is dv dt, and that's dv dx, and so remember, well, that ties everything up. And that's equal to f1 cosine x plus half naught. So this is mv dv times all of this times dx. If we integrate, we end up with the same sort of deal again. We end up with this kinetic energy change is equal to the integral right, of f1 cosine x plus f0, uh, f1 cosine chi, I should say, plus f0 d chi. Notice that this is kinetic energy change. You have a guess as to what this is. Look, we have a force over a distance. It's work, isn't it? So then we have f, is sine x minus sine x0. Okay, plus f naught x minus x naught. Suppose that again, then x naught is equal to zero and v naught is equal to zero. And then we end up what we end up with is one half m v squared is equal to f one sine x plus f naught x. That tells us what the velocity is going to be. And again, we can integrate this one more time to get our position. Notice that this is either plus or minus. And it, this just depends on our definition of x, how we've written our x. Either x is positive to the left or x is positive to the right. And uh, I didn't say which way, so it's difficult to say what, which, which sign we, ch we should choose. It's not really so it's such a big deal at the moment. So as I said, the position is the integration of v. So then we had velocity v, that's dx dt, and it's equal to that square root stuff. All right, so then dt. Well, we said dt is equal to 1 over that square root result. What I'm talking about here in the, is all of this. Okay, 1 over that dx. Integrate both sides. 
and integrate the time part, t, integrate the tau from t0 to t, well that's just t minus t0, and integrate the right hand side with respect to the dummy variable chi, and we have x0 to xf, and eventually then what we end up with, if t0 say is equal to zero, if we say that our initial time is equal to zero, then our x here, our time here, time to fly from the initial position x0 to the final position xf, well that's equal to this quantity, 1 over the square root of 2 times quantity f1 sine x plus f0 divided by m. Once we know what f1 and f0 are, and for that matter if m is just a number, then we can integrate this to find the final result. t is the time of flight to get to the location x is equal to x of f from x0. And it's not an unusual thing to do, especially with missile calculations, when you're talking about using time of flight as something you work with. So you, you say, well, what's the time of flight to the, to the intersection? And that tells you some sort of number.